Is paradise a luxury brothel? Today I invite you to consider the baffling Islamic paradise. This is not a subject I derive pleasure in, but rather disquiet from discussing, and it is not my purpose to offend any honest Muslims who might listen. So why talk about this then? Because the Islamic concept of paradise is at the very root of terrorism. If we do not understand the Islamic concept of paradise, we will never understand what motivates the terrorists that blow themselves and many others up in the name of Islam. And this is something that matters urgently to all of us. It is a matter of life and death. After examining the sacred literature of Islam, I will argue for three conclusions. One, that the Islamic paradise is for men only. Two, that the Islamic paradise is for men only, but specifically for jihadis, those terrorist soldiers who die spreading Islamism by force of arms around the world. And three, that the Islamic paradise does not welcome Muslim women because women are no longer needed there. Don't listen further if you think I'm a perfect fool and prefer to hold on to the fantasies that political correctness imposes we all parrot when we talk about Islam. But stick with me if you want to know the numerous and solid arguments that are for asserting such enormities from reading the Quran, the Hadiths, and Islamic theology and history. One thing I guarantee you won't be bored. Islam is the religion of peace. One, in Islam, paradise is for men only because you earn it in war. The Quran promises a spectacular garden of delights to anyone who obtains salvation. But in Islam, salvation is only guaranteed to those who die in jihad, the holy war to spread Islam. According to Islamic theology, according to Sahih al-Bukhari, the most revered chronicler of the sayings and deeds attributed to the Prophet, I'll leave you all references for this quote and any future quotes through the program in the notes. Don't worry if you want to go and check them out. According then to Bukhari, Muhammad harangued his troops by telling them, Paradise is to be found in the shadow of the sword. Paradise is to be found in the shadow of the sword. Paradise is to be found in war. Words of the Prophet Muhammad, as recorded by the most trustworthy and authentic source, Sahih al-Bukhari. Islam presents itself to the world as the religion of peace. But in the religion of peace, paradise is earned in war. And this war is no metaphor for that inner struggle with our emotions and inclinations. No, it is a war fought with swords, scimitars, knives, machine guns, grenades, and machetes, whatever weapon the jihadi has at hand, with real weapons that cast a shadow. Paradise is to be found in the shadow of your weapons. The weapons of the inner struggle do not cast any shadows. The weapons to which Muhammad refers are weapons that kill. What prophet of what religion you know could ever claim or suggest such a thing? This chilling statement of Muhammad, according to the very reliable, the very authentic Sahih al-Bukhari, eternally associates paradise with weapons, with warfare. What is more, he makes paradise subordinate to the wielding of weapons. In what religion you know, imagine or practice, would you earn paradise by murdering innocent people? Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Angela Merkel, and a hundred other deceitful politicians officially proclaimed on many occasions and platforms that Islam is the religion of peace. 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 But in this religion of peace, you earn paradise in war? In the religion of peace, you earn heaven, the ultimate prize, in combat? 
Islam is the religion of peace, but you must kill others to secure paradise for yourself. That sounds like double think, remember, as in George Orwell's Dystopia, 1984. The ability to hold two opposite beliefs simultaneously and believe them both to be true. That in the religion of peace, the greatest prize is won in war. Remember the slogans of the totalitarian and oppressive party in the novel 1984. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. And two plus two is five. The Islamic paradise is wed to war and therefore belongs to men who go to war. It is only guaranteed to a soldier who dies in jihad and therefore becomes a shaheed or martyr of Islam. This paradise is found in the shadow of the sword, in the shadow of weapons. Swing your sword or weapon for attack and you will discover paradise there, in the shadow of your gun, drawn and ready to strike and kill. Do you see now how this helps us understand where Islamic terrorism comes from and why Islam is the most violent religion ever? But its advocates tell us that it is the religion of peace. In what other religion in history is heaven guaranteed immediately, no questions asked, only for those who die in an act of terrorism or war? Help me, please. None comes to mind. Perhaps and stretching the concepts and contexts a lot, the Norse religion of the Vikings. But no Viking had to die with a sword in hand to reach Valhalla. Yes, warriors who died in battle would be chosen by Odin and his Valkyries to join them in the hallowed precincts of Valhalla, where they would spend eternity training during the day and feasting all night until the coming of the apocalyptic Ragnarok. This was the great motivation of Viking warriors. To be admitted to Valhalla was the great incentive to demonstrate the unrivaled and fearsome courage that the Vikings displayed on the battlefield. But the Vikings never claimed that theirs was the religion of peace. Of course, every good Muslim longs to earn paradise, but he will never be sure of it, for that will only be known on Judgment Day. Since he did not die in battle, even the Prophet Muhammad is not guaranteed heaven, if there's any justice, according to his own confession, Bukhari 5, 58 to 66. Muhammad himself was not a shaheed or martyr of Islam. But curiously, shamefully, shockingly, those who are guaranteed heaven are all the jihadis who have blown themselves up as suicide bombers, not on the battlefield, where other rules apply, but in public spaces, in cinemas, markets, airports, and airplanes, murdering untold thousands of children, women, elderly, unarmed and innocent people, civilians, destroying thousands of lives and families. And Allah is such a cruel and violent God that he rewards these butchers with paradise. And what about the rest of us who suffer the onslaught of your chosen ones, O oh, Allah, the All-Merciful? You reward these killers with paradise, Allah. Do you have anything to say to us, to the rest of us? Aren't you supposed to be the All-Compassionate, All-Loving? The truth is, Allah, you don't give a hoot about us all. Thank you. Do you understand now why so many young boys and men give up on making their lives beautiful and valuable and join instead, full of hope of winning paradise, the ranks of Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, Jamal Islamiya, Al-Shabaab, Laskar Jihad, the Islamic Army, Hezbollah, the Taliban? Oh, notice how many violent Islamic organizations we can all bring to mind that are active all over the world with thousands of adherents eager to die today to spread by arms and violence the religion of peace. Young men with no merit and no future yet dream of dying in the fight to spread Islam and thus earn the garden of delights that the Quran promises them as their reward. How odd that in this religion, 
No discipline, purification or spirituality is needed to attain paradise. Being violent and destroying the lives of countless innocent people and families in terrorist attacks in the cause of Islam is all that is required to receive the greatest reward from Allah, the All-Merciful. Islam is the religion of peace. Islam is the religion of peace. Islam is the religion of peace. Quran 36.55 states that those who deserve paradise this day are busy in joyful things. Joyful things. What joyful things are this? Let's find out. The legendary Tafsir of Ibn Kathir is the most renowned, consulted and quoted explanation of the Quran worldwide. Ibn Kathir, a theologian from the 8th century, informs us that the meaning of the Quranic text, those who deserve paradise this day are busy in joyful things, is, fasten your seatbelts, they are busy deflowering virgins. To occupy oneself with joyful things is to occupy oneself with the deflowering of virgin girls and boys. This is the explanation of Quran 3655, offered by the most revered theological commentary in the Islamic world. Don't you find it stupefyingly unbelievable? <sighs> Bravissimo, Islam. Because Islam is a religion of war, not peace, the Islamic paradise is designed for men. If Islam had ever been a religion of peace, the Islamic paradise would accommodate primarily women. But the Quran teaches precisely the opposite. Islam is a religion of war, so the Islamic paradise is designed for men. And men who find the deflowering of virgins especially appetizing and meritorious. For these men, busy with the deflowering of virgins, Surah 55 of the Quran, chapter 55 of the Quran, verses 66 to 76, offers two gurgling springs, fruits, date palms and pomegranates, beautiful wives, desirable and beautiful, who are, crucially, hoodies, beautiful, desirable females kept in pavilions, with whom no man or demon has had sexual intercourse before them, reclining on green cushions and beautiful soft mattresses. That is Quran chapter 55, verses 66 to 76. Just Google it. Even the most cursory analysis of the subject strongly suggests that the Islamic paradise is an invention to win the absolute and enthusiastic loyalty of conscript soldiers. This heaven they earn in the shadow of their guns, in the shadow of their swords, offers them precisely those tangible, sensual, desirable things the soldiers did not have while fighting for Muhammad in the desert. So many eccentric touches to note here. Do you notice that these hoodies are beautiful, desirable females kept in pavilions, with whom no man or demon has had sexual intercourse before them. The Islamic soldier, or jihadi, will receive 72 of these sensual creatures as a reward. The Islamic soldier, how important this is, will have the pleasure of being the first, because these creatures, called hoodies, are eternal virgins. Not because they are very chaste and modest, mind you, when it comes to men's appetites, Allah knows best. But because Allah endowed them with a miraculous hymen that regenerates itself after every sexual contact. The Islamic soldier will thus have the boon of 72 virgins to start from scratch with every time, forever and ever. And how will he solve the astronomical riddle of attending to 72 fiery virgins daily, for all eternity. I'll tell you how. Actually, the Hadiths will tell us how. In the previous episode of this podcast, titled Islam Hates Women, Don't Miss It, 
we explained what an eccentric and often embarrassing thing hadiths are. Hadiths are the sayings and deeds, the lies and legends, attributed to the Prophet by various people over two centuries of oral tradition. This is all explained in more detail in the previous episode. There is a hadith, one of these patently spurious legends that make Muhammad look bad, but which the guardians of Islam have decided to glorify as trustworthy for theological rulings. There is a hadith that claims that Muhammad said, Allah will marry everyone he admits to paradise to 72 wives, all of whom will have desirable frontal passages. And the believer will have a penis that never becomes flaccid. <sighs> Holy Viagra. Because with 72 lusty women lined up, that will be an excruciating marathon to run every single day. I'm not making this up. Is this Una even Maja? Don't worry, I'll leave all the details in the notes. This number of 72 playful virgins is not in the Quran but it is in the Hadiths, so it has become part of the popular image of the Islamic paradise because the fierce, bearded guardians of Islam insist on relying on Hadiths to interpret the Quran, when it should have been the other way around. But the Ayatollahs and the Muftis and the Imams love their Hadiths and keep forcing them on every innocent Muslim, even when they make Islam and the Prophet look terribly backward, irrational and cruel. And if one hadith has Muhammad declaring that the chosen ones will have penises that never go limp and 72 hoodies to take advantage of this bounty, another hadith continues in the same direction with Muhammad declaring that the believer will have in paradise an extraordinary impetus for intercourse. The believer will receive the sexual strength of 100 men. Thank goodness because it will take all that vigor to keep your 72 hoodies satisfied. <sighs> and these are supposed to be theological texts, theological writings. Women with desirable frontal passages, men with penises in perpetual erection and with the sexual vigor of 100 men. These are theological topics and theological texts. Islam? Did you know, by the way, that the theological thesis with which Ayatollah Khomeini, remember that very angry man who toppled the Shah of Iran decades ago, attained the title of Ayatollah, the highest echelon of wisdom in Shia Islam, his thesis has to do with the thorny topic of when and how a good Muslim is allowed to copulate with a chicken. What universe do you live in, Islam? What universe are you still holding on to, oh my Muslim friend? How come you haven't fled Islam yet? In what religion that you imagine, know or practice, would these scandalous and utterly crude adolescent fantasies be regarded as theological texts, topics worthy of the reflection and analysis of any pious and learned theologian? Thousands of hadiths sound like monumental jokes, and I would to God it was so. But sadly and regrettably, this is why the flow of recruits to the ranks of Islamic terrorism will never cease. With such promises, 72 eternal virgins, a perpetually erect penis, and the sexual might of 100 men for whoever wins paradise, it is once again crystal clear that this paradise was conceived as the ultimate prize for utterly immature men. As long as the Quran, the infallible, untainted, immutable, unchanging words of Allah for all eternity, continues to promise sexy virgins to any violent sociopath on the planet as a reward for being more violent than ever before in their lives, Islamic terrorism will continue to flourish forever and ever to the eternal shame of honest Muslims, their prophet, and Islam. And if you look at the statistics, you will notice that Islam grows faster than ever, unsurprisingly, in prisons around the world, where violent men had already gathered for being violent 
and where Muslim preachers now visit them to offer them glory with 72 fiery virgins as a reward for taking revenge on the society that is punishing them because they are already violent. The preachers of Islam cowardly and disgustingly exploit the resentment and violence these prisoners already have to turn them into human weapons of war and destruction. This is a sanctification and glorification of violence whose consequences threaten us all, including any good ordinary Muslim, as you can imagine. Islam is the religion of peace. Islam is the religion of peace. Islam is the religion of faith. Islamic terrorism will continue to grow and multiply forever because Islam's glorification and sexualization of violence will naturally attract the most disturbed and violent minds and reward them for being violent. Muslim jihadists are not and never will be holy people who die for a sacred cause, who deserve respect and admiration for opening their hearts and minds to be purified, for becoming more spiritual and better human beings and giving their lives out of love for humanity, like true martyrs do. Islamic jihadists are men with psychopathic tendencies that Islamic theology accommodates and praises. Aimless desperados who join political operatives for the feeling of finally doing something meaningful with their lives. Rotherless youths who cowardly and selfishly murder thousands of innocent people every year around the world to earn their ticket to an eternity of sex, luxury, and unrestrained voluptuousness. Because that's what Islam promises them. And what can Islam offer all those innocent, peaceful, ordinary civilians who were killed so that these psychopaths could earn their tickets to heaven? Allah, the All-Merciful, couldn't care less. The jihadi has already earned his ticket to paradise, and as to his victims, well, we all are just collateral damage. It's our own fault for being in the wrong place at the wrong time, as a psychopath was earning his ticket to heaven. And all that innocent bloodshed will weigh eternally on Islam and on the head of whoever defends Islam and tries to explain this away. Muslim jihadists are under the illusion that they are part of a vast divine plan. Ponder with me. What monstrous God but the God of Islam would inspire and reward countless acts of violence, blood, and destruction every day around the world. What monster is this Allah, the All-Merciful, the Compassionate, the All-Knowing? Islam is the religion of peace. Islam is the religion of peace. Islam is the religion of peace. We've already read from surahs, chapters. 36 and 55 of the Quran. But hey, surahs 44, 52, 54, and 56 contain scandalous gems too. This concept of paradise as a luxury brothel for the violent is not an isolated passage in the holy text. Paradise as a luxury brothel is a recurring theme in the holy Quran. Surah 44, verses 51 to 57 of the Quran, reinforces the promise of an eternity of unbounded sensual pleasure and promises security and peace to the exhausted warriors of jihad. Verily, the pious will be in a place of safety, among gardens and springs, clothed in fine, dense silk, conversing with one another. We will unite them in marriage with beautiful, wide-eyed hoodies. They will enjoy in peace and security every kind of fruit, and they will never taste death except the first death of this world. And Allah will save them from the torment of the burning fire as a reward from your Lord. And such will be the highest victory. Is it me, or once again, we can see how very conveniently this was written for jihadis in a war campaign? The pious will be in a place of security. Why would it be necessary to promise security to someone who lives quietly and peacefully at home? Surah 56, 15-37 describes those who win paradise being seated on thrones encrusted with gold and precious stones. 
and for those who may prefer young boys instead of hoodies, immortal waiters, I mean immortal youths, to attend to their every need. They will have at hand whatever fruit they crave, the flesh of whatever fowls they may desire, beautiful big-eyed hoodies like cultivated pearls, palm trees with fruits piled one on top of the other, planted by waters that flow endlessly, and reclining suggestively on bouncy couches, maidens of special creation, virgins, loving, and who will never grow old. Do you see why I dare to suspect this paradise was conveniently conceived to keep soldiers disciplined and longing in their ranks? Imagine you are a foot soldier in Mohammed's forces in one of the 86 bloody battles of aggression personally led by Mohammed, the prophet of peace, of the religion of peace, and it is 7th century Arabia. And you have been in the desert for weeks with no food, no water, no family and no rest because you're fighting and you sleep when you can among the rocks and sands of the desert. Can you better appreciate how attractive, how desirable it sounds to sit on thrones encrusted with jewels, feasting on wine and whatever fruit or meat you fancy, amid rivers of waters that never cease while the most handsome young men wait on you and fan you? There is wine flowing like rivers, a most unusual offer given that on earth drinking wine is a sin that Mohammed punished by stoning, but in paradise... One is a prize worthy of the elect. And on top of all this, as a crowning glory, reclining suggestively on sumptuous couches, maidens of special creation, virgins, loving and more than willing, who never grow old. Stop it, Gabriel. You must understand these are all metaphors. It's symbolic language to describe spiritual truths. It is not to be taken literally. It's to be interpreted symbolically. <sighs> Look, if the Quran were to speak only of palm trees, fruits, and rivers that never cease to flow, there would be no doubt that it can all be understood as images that point to spiritual truths. The palm trees, the fruits, and the rivers whose waters never cease are symbols of life, fertility, health. But what about the immortal youths serving you wines and meats without limit, and the joyful deflowering of virgins, and the hoodies, creatures created by Allah for sexual satisfaction, with languid and inviting looks and desirable frontal passages, waiting for you reclining on soft couches, and mattresses. Ah, and also, and very conveniently, right on cue, the penis that never goes flaccid, and the sexual might of one hundred men. Tell me, what spiritual virtue could all these crude, steamy images represent? Sorry, but these are not symbols. They are erotic delusions, nocturnal emissions. Or is it that my dirty Latin macho mind won't let me interpret such descriptions more spiritually. Listen, you and I and all of us are looking for a cause, a dream, an ideal that moves us to bigger and better things every day, especially as teenagers. This is a healthy, beautiful impulse that will drive us to aspire to bigger and higher things every day. But when a Muslim preacher promises aimless young people eternal glory, inflames them with resentment against others, makes them feel that their lives will finally count for something, and offers them this luxury brothel as a reward for killing innocent people in cities and communities all over the planet, we are all in danger. That is why I deplore and openly denounce this Islamic doctrine of eternal pleasures as a reward for the violent. And how I wish that the language of these chapters of the Quran were only symbolic, metaphorical, that these pleasures described in such sensual detail were only poetic images pointing to spiritual ideals. But sadly they are not, 
and the young jihadis do not understand it that way either. Young jihadis are not concerned with spiritual pursuits. All they have in mind as they blow themselves up, leaving behind a gruesome trail of violence and destruction, are the 72 hoodies. Let us stop endorsing terrorist violence by making excuses for it. Let us stop burying our heads in the sand. Two, now you agree with me, I hope, that the Islamic paradise seems to have been designed to reward men, but not just any men either, but jihadi soldiers. Let's dig a little deeper. A paradise as sensual and voluptuous as the one promised in the Quran is extremely difficult for any Muslim to earn based on good deeds alone. According to Islamic theology, every saint and even the Prophet Muhammad himself will be in check until the last moment until they appear before the throne of Allah. Entrance to paradise depends only on Allah's will, and Allah is not bound to anything to anyone. Allah does not make any promises he must keep to anyone, and he will only grant paradise to whom he wills at the end of time. Since Muhammad did not die in battle, Muhammad didn't automatically get his golden ticket to heaven. Incidentally, he died poisoned by the widow of a Jewish leader whom he had burned alive to reveal where his hidden treasures were. And all this is recorded in lurid detail in the official Islamic biography of the Prophet, the Sirat Rasulallah. I leave you the details in the notes. So, if there is any justice, Muhammad himself will be to this day on tender hooks as to what his eternal destiny will be. What will the last judgment be like according to Islamic theology? Our old favorite, Sahih al-Bukhari, Bukhari the reliable, the authentic, the trustworthy, has the answer. Every person's good and bad deeds will be weighed on a scale as this terrified person walks on a slippery bridge narrower than a hair and sharper than a sword with hooks like thorns along the way over hellfire. Picture yourself walking on a slippery bridge more narrow than a hair, sharper than a sword, and full of thorns on top of that, that stretches over hellfire. There's just no hope. And it would only be fair for Mohammed to go through this unsurmountable ordeal, too. Most Muslims are innocent, honest, and excellent people. But every Muslim must fear this chilling scenario on the Day of Reckoning with no certainty that their good deeds will be enough to outweigh their evil deeds on a last scale as they walk on a slippery bridge narrower than a hair and sharper than a sword. And that's not all. The cruelest and most toxic thing is that the only Muslim who can ever rest easy is the one who dies in jihad, the holy war to spread Islam. All good and excellent Muslims, and there are billions of them, mm, who knows? Ah, but the psychopathic terrorists of the Islamic army who proudly posed, Google it, with dozens of heads of innocent people beheaded by them as they spread the lights of Islam across the land, Oh, come straight through all at once, my chosen ones. Paradise is wide open and no questions asked of you. Unbelievable. And every honest Muslim must feel eternally ashamed and know that they make themselves personally responsible for that bloodshed every time they stand up to defend Islam. Jihad is the golden ticket to glory with no stopover or delay. Only a violent jihadi fulfills every requirement in one fell swoop, dying in combat to spread the religion of peace around the planet. Islam is the religion of peace. Islam is the religion of peace. Islam is the religion of peace. If Muhammad had asked himself, how do I keep these tired, thirsty, and hungry men fighting for me and with feverish enthusiasm until death? This is precisely 
what he would have come up with. The quickest and most powerful solution is to promise them torrents of water, exotic fruits, the flesh of delicate birds, silk robes, cushioned armchairs, and above all, those hoodies, beautiful maidens of special creation, that is to say, limited edition, with large eyes who always please and never age, and whose only function is to keep them in perpetual sexual ecstasy. Do you see why I suspect this is a paradise tailor-made for soldiers dying of hunger and thirst in the desert? Hmm. Is this why the idea found its way into the Koran? And not once, but several times. It's in chapters 44, 52, 54, 55, 56, and 61 of the Koran, if you choose to look them up. Oh, Gabriel, but there are many pacifist Muslims. Of course. And what are they still doing in Islam, then? Do you know that Mohammed calls every pacifist Muslim a hypocrite? This is in Sahih Muslim, Sunnah Abu Dawood. I quote, And the Prophet added, He who dies without having fought or planned to fight in jihad for the cause of Allah will die a hypocrite. Mohammed calls every pacifist Muslim a hypocrite. Thank you for clarifying this, O Messenger of Allah, and the perfect example for all mankind. Islamic paradise does not welcome Muslim women because women are no longer needed there. Today we can establish that the sensual descriptions of the Islamic paradise were stolen from Hindu and Zoroastrian poems. For example, the Islamic word firdaus or paradise derives from the ancient Persian Avestan word pirdaus. It's almost identical and is found in Quran 18.107 and Quran 23.11, if you want to check it out. As much as 70% of the Quran was hastily and clumsily pieced together from fragments and texts taken from other religions and sources, which puts paid to the notion that Allah revealed it to Muhammad untouched, unchanged, hot off the press. No, ladies and gentlemen, 70% of the material in the Quran was already found and more fully and much better narrated, by the way, in Jewish, Christian, Zoroastrian, Hindu, Gnostic, and pagan texts, all of which predate the Quran by centuries. The Quran invariably steals from them. It does not improve on them. But that will be material for another future episode. What we urgently need to ask ourselves today is this. And women? Muslim women. Where does a pious Muslim woman fit in the hyper-sexualized male paradise of the Quran? What price does an honest and sweet Muslim woman, and there are millions and millions of them, get in this private club of adolescent fantasies? Where is there room for a mother, a grandma, an auntie, a sister, a daughter, a wife? the good and devout Muslim women who spent their lives serving and obeying the men of their family and tribe because that was the role assigned to them by the Prophet forever. Where is there room for them who genuinely deserve paradise if everything in paradise has been designed for the delight of men? Imagine all the gentlemen having a fantastic time with all that wine and all that music flowing and all those sexy girls, and the eternal youths. And suddenly, in the middle of the party, their moms, their wives, their sisters, their daughters show up. Their presence would only spoil the party. Their presence would only cancel paradise for all of them, because what man would want to have his mother, his wife, his grandma, his auntie, his sister, or his daughter present 
while he is having such good fun with 72 maidens of special creation who always please and never grow old, and whose only cosmic function is to keep them in perpetual sexual ecstasy. Tell me, dear listener, how could this paradise of the Quran ever work for women? How could this paradise of the Quran ever work for you, dear Muslim woman who I hope is listening to me? In all fairness, there would have to be a second paradise, a parallel paradise, in which women receive 72 Chippendales to entertain them day and night. Can you imagine? Oh, Muslim friend, oh, jihadi soldier, a heaven where 72 stallions happily attend to your sister, your grandma, your mother, your auntie, your daughter, your wife, night and day, forever and ever. This is the most basic pedestrian problem when paradise is only a matter of sensual and sexual fulfillment for men. Your mom, grandma, auntie, sister, wife and daughter, women, also deserve paradise if they are good, and I'm sure most of them are better human beings than you and me. So their paradise must be as desirable as that of men. If men are gifted 72 hoodies whose sole mission is to please their appetites for all eternity, how can we deny 72 stallions to wives and daughters who were so sweet and obedient all the time? How could we deny them to our mothers, aunties, grandmas, or sisters, our daughters, who were so docile and self-sacrificing all their days? The Quran offers limitless sensuality as a reward at the end of time. In that case, women deserve a hen party, a bachelorette party, as unforgettable as the biggest party in a super luxury brothel. Whew. Tell me, Muslim friend, tell me, jihadi soldier, do you find it scandalous and profane to imagine this eternity for the women of your family? And of course it is. But it is okay to imagine it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Could it be that in Islam the rules of the game are entirely different for women? Could it be that Islam hates, demeans, and stultifies women? Do you see why I dare conclude the Islamic paradise is only suitable for men? To be credible and desirable, paradise must be beyond the limitations of this world, beyond the voluptuousness and sensuality of this plane on which we live. Only then can paradise be an ascent, an achievement infinitely superior, higher to our present situation, a realm of incalculable light beyond the limits and appetites of this world. But the Koran can only think of promising the exaggeration, a cosmic blow-up of the coarse sensualities of earth, sex and genitals without limit, the culmination, not the disappearance of all carnal appetite forever and ever. This is a staggering error in any religion or spiritual practice that wants to push us towards purity, simplicity, and a higher state of consciousness. The paradise described in the Quran is not for those who seek virtue. It sounds more like a strategy to recruit free soldiers. It is not a paradise that would suit or appeal to any decent and pure woman, to any spiritual and pure man. In the previous episode of this podcast, titled Islam Hates Women, we saw that Muhammad accuses women of being most of the inhabitants of hell and inferior to men in intelligence, devotion, personal worth, biology, and character. Please listen to that episode, Islam Hates Women, if you haven't listened to it yet. But as we look today at the concept of paradise in Islam, we discover that women not only suffer gross discrimination in this life, but are discriminated against in the hereafter as well. Women are not invited to this paradise simply because their services 
are no longer required there. The chosen ones who reach paradise will not need their wives anymore because they will be treated to perpetual ecstasy by 72 maidens of special creation, according to Quran chapter 56. And on top of this, there are already many waiters, like hidden pearls, serving exquisite delicacies and wines all the time. So what other role could Muslim women play if their husbands, fathers, sons, brothers, grandfathers, uncles had already been opulently served by supernatural women with desirable frontal passages with whom no man or demon has had sexual intercourse before them? None. All the services women render to men on earth have been upgraded to a level they could never attain, however obedient and sweet they may have been. This cosmic upgrade makes Muslim women obsolete so that they no longer have any function and are no longer needed. Why bring women into paradise if they are no longer needed? So the Prophet and the Quran did not invite them. Who needs his mother, auntie, wife, sister, daughter or grandma present when he is having cosmic fun in a luxury brothel? Women have no place in the Quranic paradise because there will be eternal prostitutes and eternal youths to take care of every whim and appetite of their men. So the Prophet and the Quran did not invite them. Farewell. The Quranic heaven is for men only and women do not fit in it. They would be blushing and humiliated to see all that goes on in that place seeing their husbands and fathers gloating over eternal prostitutes. Any intelligent woman would rather not go in there, even if an angel drove her in a limo and gave her free admission. No honest woman wants to be or should be in the Koran's luxury brothel. There must be, hanging at the gates, a sign saying, To all Muslim women. Thank you for your lifelong service and your self-denial, but your services are no longer needed. Goodbye and good luck. Thank you for listening. My name is Gabriel Porras. I am a philosopher, producer, journalist, podcaster, and voice artist. Visit me at gabrielvoice.com and radiantwhispers.com if you want to hear more of my work. Leave me your comments and share this with other people, especially Muslim friends, because I find that the vast majority of Muslims do not know what is written in their own holy texts. They would be surprised and alarmed to find this out. And if you're a Muslim person, man or woman, and I hurt you, I'm very sorry. That was never my intention. I was only quoting the Quran and the Hadiths and the biography of the Prophet. All of those are sanctioned Islamic texts. I wish you a wonderful life away from Islam. <laughs>